It's really difficult to um, replace Senator Chen Oakley. She was wonderful. She, she really got the human element and, and human resources and, and the needs of this community. So whoever steps into her place has big shoes to fill. Homelessness, high property crime rates, and a lack of affordable housing are all problems that plague the urban neighborhoods of downtown Honolulu, Nuuanu, and Laliha. But the three Democratic candidates hoping to be the district's next senator say they have plans to fix what's broken. We have all of them here for tonight's discussion. Insights on PBS Hawaii is next. Aloha, I'm Mahalani Richardson, and welcome to Insights on PBS Hawaii. For more than two decades, Senator Suzanne Chun Oakland represented the district that includes downtown, Nu'uwanu, and Liliha. But now her seat is vacant. Three Democrats want a chance to prove that they can continue her legacy. With issues like homelessness and property crime on the minds of many voters in the district, how do these candidates plan to solve these massive problems? They're here tonight to talk about their ideas for change. Now, we hope you'll participate in tonight's discussion. You can email, call, or tweet your questions and comments. And you'll find a live stream of this program at pbshawaii.org. Now, prior to tonight's show, there was a random draw that determined the seating order and the order that we'll use throughout the program. Now to the candidates. Commissioner Kim Koko Iwamoto worked as an attorney for Legal Aid Society of Hawaii and Volunteer Legal Services Hawaii. She was elected to two terms at the Hawaii Board of Education and is currently an appointed commissioner for the Hawaii Civil Rights Commission. Kione Nakoa is an attorney who grew up in Nu'uwanu. Mr. Nakoa has previously served at the State Office of Consumer Protection as well as the Honolulu Civil Service Commission. And State Representative Carl Rhodes has represented Kalihi, Palama, Ivile, and Chinatown in the legislature for 10 years. Representative Rhodes currently serves as the chair of the House Judiciary Committee. Now tonight we'd like to start off by getting to know a little bit about each of you and talk about some of the biggest issues facing your district, and that's homelessness. Now we'll continue the discussion by examining the issue of property crime in the district, and then we'll explore other important issues, and of course we'll continue to ask you questions posed by our viewers. And tonight we'll close tonight's program with an excerpt from Monday Night's Insights. The three mayoral candidates exchanged in a heated conversation that was available only via our live stream. But first, let's take a look at the demographic makeup of District 13. This state senate district with just over 56,000 residents covers Laliha, Palama, Ivole, Kalihi, Nu'uanu, Pacific Heights, Pa'oa, Lower Tantalus, and Downtown. The median age is 44 years old. 76% of the residents are Asian, 22.5% Caucasian, and just under 17% say they are Native Hawaiian or Pacific Islander. There are 12,800 families, and the average household income is $54,654. 13% of all residents and 10% of all families are living below the poverty level. 42% speak a language other than English. The median value of an owner-occupied housing unit is $591,800, and the median monthly rental fee is $968. So Suzanne Chan Oakland, as we all know, was a, a true advocate for social services, uh, you know, for the elderly and homeless and, and even childhood issues. Uh, I wanted to start off with you, Co Commissioner Iwamoto. Would you fight as hard as the senator for these sorts of issues? Um, I have been fighting very hard on these issues since 2001. I became a public interest attorney in order to serve the community. In fact, my first, um, career, my first job was as managing attorney of Volunteer Legal Services Hawaii, and that's when I first met Senator Suzanne Chan Oakland. She was on our board, and she was very inspiring. And um, I've continued to um, wanted, to, I've continued to serve, I try to serve up to her the way she's been serving, um, serving homelessness. I've been a foster parent to teenagers who've been previously homeless. Um, I am also a business owner, and um, uh, half of my units that um, I have an apartment building, half of the units I've allocated to low income as well as previously homeless families. Mr. Nakoa, would you have these same priorities as the senator, or would you try to shift the priorities of the district? 
Well, I think a lot of Senator Chen Oakland's priorities were her priorities because exactly because they were the priorities from the community. And for me, growing up there in Nuona and Poa, you know, my family has been there for five generations, over 100 years, both sides. And so, you know, I really want to make sure that I am dealing with the, the issues that our community is concerned with. So it is, like you said, homelessness has been the number one issue that people have been talking to me about when I go door to door. Um, and personally, my parents are both school teachers. So another issue that, you know, is near and dear to my heart is education and making sure that we're empowering our teachers to engage our keiki and make sure that you know people our students are ready for the next step after high school no matter what that is and the last thing is, um, that would be a priority for me is making sure that we're funding aging in place programs for our kupuna um, care, family caregiving has been a very personal issue for me um, you know, recently my mother passed away and me and we had to do some home hospice care for her and i just am so thankful that she was a retired teacher, so she had a lot of um, benefits and, and things like that. Uh, and we also had help from St. Francis Hospital, our hospice. So I also understand that not every family is as lucky as we were. So I want to make sure that our state is giving the family caregivers the support that they need. You know, family caregivers who are willing to sacrifice and willing to give back to the people who raise them and care for them. We need to make sure that they have the know-how, the knowledge, and the support that they need to, to be able to take on that, that great task. Representative Rhodes, uh, you heard from one of the viewers, uh, whoever fills the seat has big shoes to fill. Could you fill those shoes? Well, I'm certainly going to try. I, um, I've said that my almost exactly the same words, uh, big slip is to fill, to fill Susie's seat. She works incredibly hard. I've been a colleague, a friend and colleague of hers for the last 10 years in the legislature, and we've worked on a lot of things together. Before I forget, though, I just wanted to extend my condolences to Mr. Nicole about your mother. I, I, that's not good news, and I'm sorry to hear it. Um, Susie and I, you know, we've cooperated on every, from the Manini to the spectacularly important, well, maybe I shouldn't go that far, but to the very complex statewide issues. You know, we've worked on a lot of neighborhood uh, cleanups together. Uh, we've also worked on bills of hers that I had a particular interest in as well. Uh, specifically, we worked on one that she authored that was called Assisted Community Treatment that basically would put, um, instead of putting people into the state hospital where basically only those who have committed a crime go to the state hospital these days because it's so overcrowded, her bill would make it so that um, if the person was a danger to themselves or others, uh, a judge could order them to stay on their meds without actually putting them into the state hospital. Uh, I think it's a very important bill to get to the really hard cases in, of homelessness. There has to be some addressing of the severely mentally ill, and that was a bill that I helped her and went through. It went, came through judiciary, but I've also worked with her extensively on. And certainly, that's a high priority issue for me too. I live in Chinatown. Every time I step out of my condo. Uh, there's somebody screaming and nobody, and uh, mm -hmm. you know it's it's sad, and it's better for that person to have them to have care, and it's better for all the people in the, in the area to have that person getting care. Right, and you know, mental illness and oftentimes homelessness are, are, are linked, and the neighborhoods that make up the district <laughs> are on the front lines of Hawaii's homeless crisis, and most of the residents and business owners uh, we spoke to actually told us that they feel that the homeless situation has gotten a little better. Now, one man had a suggestion for the next step in this process, and let's hear his suggestion, and you can comment after that. In comparison to when we opened five years ago, it truly does feel a bit of like night and day, which is really, really fabulous. The more we do get families down here, the more we do get international people through here, um, I think it just like, that's going to be such a great presence that um, slowly but surely we'll still continuously see the sort of homelessness and the drug community move away a little bit more. Um, I think that like there could always be like more enforcement of certain uh, like the sit and lie and stuff like that. Um, but I think like generally speaking, just viewing this area in a positive light and really promoting it as a positive place to be. And this particular business owner uh, in Chinatown, and you know, I grew up near the area, and homelessness was always an issue, and and then it seemed to get worse. Mr. Nicole, what's your perception of of how bad homelessness is, specifically in the Chinatown area, and what would be your solutions for making it better? Well, I mean, I'm sure you know the statistics. We've seen homelessness increase to 26 percent since 2009, and there's an estimated 5,000 homeless folks on Oahu alone. Um, not to mention 
the, the related issue of 25,000 units needed of affordable housing right now. So, you know, to me, what we really need to make sure, first and foremost, is that we're increasing or we're decreasing that shortage of affordable housing, um, and then we're dealing with the root causes of homelessness. And we have to attack those root, ho those, uh, root causes head on. Um, so when I talk about root causes, four of the things that I'm talking about are, um, like you mentioned, uh, people who have fallen on some hard times, mental health issues, and substance abuse and addiction, and then you know, folks, a minority of folks who have chosen homelessness as a lifestyle. Um, and they all have different uh, ways to attack or ways, ways to reach those people. Um, and we need to you know, do what we can. But I think something that we need to make sure that we're doing is approaching it with our, our eyes on effectiveness, but our hearts filled with um, compassion. Commissioner, how do you think uh, state lawmakers are dealing with the situation right now as we stand, and, and what would be your solutions? Well, I'm concerned that all we, it seems that we're doing on a state level is just throwing money at the, we've allocated money to a problem, but it doesn't seem like there's a plan in place. And I think we need to have more of a plan. Um, there is no master plan for Hawaii or even Oahu. Um, even on the city county level, it's money that's been allocated via district, and there's been no cohesion, um, no sharing of resources across the districts. Um, we need to think of ways that, first of all, address raising the minimum wage to a livable wage. There's a lot of families, as we know, living paycheck to paycheck that are on the verge of slipping into homelessness. And when I served on the, um, when I did legal clinics across the state, we helped people stay in their apartments. Um, I think those services are, we need more of those services. Uh, we need more resources, more safety nets, um, perhaps even a rent control option combined with other options. But we definitely have a shortage of affordable rentals. According to Hawaii Appleseed, for every 100 families that need affordable housing, there's only 29 units. And I can tell you as a land landlord, apartment building owner, um, when I put a unit um, on the market that's not part of the allocated for low income or previously homeless, you, uh, those rentals go in a day. That's how tight the market is. It's, and that's what first alerted me to the fact that I need to put some aside, at least 50% for families, because a lot of the ads on Craigslist say no Section 8. So they're automatically cut out of the marketplace. So that's one of them. I mean, maybe we need to say you can't deny somebody um, a place to rent based on their, where their income, where their rent payment comes from. That could be a start. Um, but we need to definitely increase the options. Re Representative, do you think the situation has improved at a fast enough rate for the public's appetite? And, and would you agree that there needs to be a master plan? Uh, well, first of all, you know, the, 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 the commenter said they felt like it had gotten better. And, and as someone who's lived in Chinatown for 20 years, I think in the last 20 years it's gotten better. Having said that, I agree with Mr. Nicola that the, you know, the point in time counts indicate that the last several years it's gone up pretty dramatically until this year. And this year it went up by one-tenth of one percent on Oahu. So it's hard to tell whether that's, you know, what the cause of that is. Uh, I think there is more of a master plan than uh, Ms. Iwamoto would, would uh, uh, agree that, there, that is happening. That both the city and the, and the state have gone full, uh, full full steam ahead with housing first, which is, for years we have told people who are sleeping on the street that you have to quit drinking, you have to quit doing drugs before we'll put you in a house. For housing first, quite logically, when you think about it, it's very difficult to stop a drug addi addiction uh, when you're lying on the sidewalk. We finally sort of figured that out, said, okay, we'll put you in the house first, and then we'll try to get you off the drugs and the alcohol. But both the city and the, and the estate are moving forward with housing first. It is a matter of, of, we do need more units. We do need, uh, I, I agree that Section 8 should be uh, uh, always an acceptable, uh, whatever your legal source of income, that should be allowed to get you an apartment. And I've, I've had a bill several years in a row now that would do that. And there's a lot of resistance to it, and that's why it hasn't passed. Uh, landlords aren't necessarily keen about that. Uh, I've always thought it was sort of oxymoronic because a lot of times the difficulty you have with low-income tenants as a, from a landlord perspective is they don't pay the rent. Well, with Section 8, it's, you know, it's backed by the full faith and credit of the United States of America, and you're going to get paid sooner or later. 
there's, there's, there is a, a timeliness of payment issue there, but uh, bottom line is, you know, the state and the county are committing a lot of resources to this. Um, there is money needed to do it, and if there weren't the money that was being put on the table, my guess is that that climb for more homelessness would have continued, but this year it is hopefully flattened out, and I think it means that we're starting to see some effects from the policies that we're adopting. Uh, Commissioner, <laughs> I wanted, you wanted to weigh in, and, and yes, before you, you do, you know, well, someone says that it just seems like they're just moving out of the district to another area from one place to the next. So you, do, you, exactly. do you think I that think there's already so a plan in place? No, and I think we say housing first, but we need housing first. We have a shortage of affordable rentals. We have no place to put them. So even if they get sober, we don't have apartments available. And that's why we see so many families. And that's why landlords are, it's so easy to let a tenant go for many landlords because you know you can fill that unit somewhere else. It's just, again, there's not there's insufficient housing. Mm -hmm. So to make that promise, I mean, and that to me is an indication that there is no plan. Where are all the homeless uh, affordable, the, the housing options for homeless or very low income families? We don't have that. We haven't created an, an incentive program for developers to to say if you, if you, if you build a, a housing option, a building that can accommodate um, low-income families or previously homeless people, we will give you special consideration when you come for a permit. We will speed it up. There's options, there's ways to incentivize so that we create housing options. But definitely the fact that we have no housing options and the incentives aren't working for developers says to me we don't have a, an efficient plan if there is one. You know, the, obviously there's this link between affordable housing and uh, the homelessness crisis. Mr. Nicole, what would be your solution for, uh, you know, solving the, not solving, but at least moving forward with the affordable housing crisis to help homelessness? Mm -hmm. I, you know, I think we have to work with private partnerships. Um, there's simply, like you said, there is not enough housing uh, one way or another. They're just not being built. And kind of, I think part of the issue is income inequality. Um, along with housing inequality, there's a lot of there's a lot of units up at the top level, and there's some units up at the bottom level. And like you said, they're they're open and they rotate, but there's not many in that mid-level range. Um, and we need to make sure that I guess we're working with developers and private industry to build, incentivize, like like Kim was saying, uh, make sure that we're using those incentives to build housing that we need to get people into. Um, so, you know, I'm a 30 year old and you know I still live with my parents partially because well, my father be partially because um, the rent is free <laughs> but also because I can't really afford to get own place get a place of my own um, you know and, and I think that is a big issue that we need to address and we need to pull private industry in representative do you think the the community's reputation has suffered because of the homelessness issue and the number of homeless in the area for, in multiple districts. Absolutely. I mean, it, people are afraid to come to Chinatown. Yeah. Uh, I would like to back up, though, to talk about the, what the state is already doing. And, you know, I agree that the, the private, there, there's a market failure there, that the, the market will always give us more high-end uh, properties because that's where you can make the most money. And that's the, that's the primary reason we don't get the uh, lower income housing that we need. But it's not true to say that, the, that both the state and the city are involved in um, building affordable housing. We are. Um, the dwell, Dwelling Unit Revolving Fund, the Rental Housing Trust Fund, these are both, there's, and there's a couple of other funds that also work on uh, housing issues at the state funds, and it is a private-public partnership. The, the developer is a private developer, but we give them the money that they need to make, the, the, to make it pencil out. They can it's all pretty much a science at this point. They know what the income stream is going to be from the apartments, and then they say, okay, you need X number of dollars. Uh, senior residence in Evil A, a, a project in, in Evil A that I helped get built, state put in $20, 000, $20 million, and it's, it's built and it's up, and there's people living there that might be, you know, some of them probably would be homeless if it hadn't been built. 
Uh, I'm going to move on to another topic. Obviously, ho homelessness incredibly complicated when you're dealing with uh, the, the chronically homeless and then people who might be homeless sometimes. But uh, I wanted to move on to property crime, which is a big issue in the district. And uh, what are the factors contributing to the high property crime rate? And what would you do to reduce the crime rate in your area? Commissioner, why don't I start off with you? Well, I think addiction is, um, is a medical issue. And I think we have to approach um, the therapy around addiction and I think a lot of um, the property crimes are connected to addiction and we need to treat addiction not as a social stigma but as a health issue. Um, we need to make sure that there are sufficient beds in treatment facilities and that it meets the needs of the communities that, that need these services. Um, I know when, the, uh, when we went through our last recession um, a lot of services were cut and that fueled um, some, uh, an increase in addiction and, um, and I would say then people would turn to property crimes. Um, but we definitely need to address it as a therapy. It's interesting how all of these issues are, are interrelated. Mm -hmm. Mr. Nicola, you know, we just heard about a bakery being robbed last night in Chinatown. What would you say to this uh, bakery owner and what would you do to protect businesses in the district? I mean, there's nothing really you can say when something like that happens, except for that, you know, as the state and hopefully the city will try to will do better. Uh, but I, I do agree with what Commissioner Iwamoto was saying about it being uh, related, very related to addiction and substance abuse, and that we need to treat that as a health problem. I think something that uh, that we need that also needs to be said is that we need to not treat it as a straight criminal justice problem because when we throw people in jail for um, possession, minor possession of drugs and um, you know, possession uh, of marijuana or you know, residue in pipes, that starts them along uh, kind of a cycle of where they, they, they're in prison, they're dependent upon uh, the system for food and everything, they get out of prison, they're not ready to rejoin society because those programs in prison aren't there. They're not trying to rehabilitate people. So one of the big things that I'd like to see more of is, um, is, is helping people along in a, in treating it as a medical way and then also having restorative justice as options that uh, are really, that are going to be working. And I know the judiciary and um, Chief Justice Rechtenwald are actually working on this. Representative Rhodes, you want to uh, address that? Uh, well, yeah, I'm sure. about the judiciary. It's, uh, it's, um, it's something that we've, that I've been pushing for as judiciary chair that it, I agree that it's, uh, there's, there's multiple reasons for what, what we need to, what we need to use criminal encounters for and in the first instance is an intervention. You use it as an intervention. Don't say we're going to automatically send you to jail on your first go. But I do think that at some point, um, if you've sort of demonstrated to the world that you're going to be a, you're, this is going to be a career for you, just for the protection of everybody else, we have to come down a little harder. And the Penal Code Review Commission agreed uh, with me when we met, when I was on it, and we met last year and the bill that came out of that we did pass. And that was basically the trade-off. We said, okay, first time we're, we're going to be easier on you, but the second, you know, the, the, when you start doing multiple offenses, we're not going to be anymore. But just sending people to prison, as Mr. Nicola in, has pointed out, is a, it doesn't really help anything. It's sort of like a graduate school for criminals in many cases. And so even though it's sort of counterintuitive, the sort of get tough on crime doesn't actually work. It's better to do something else for the first for the first offenders. Right. For, I mean, it seems like for years, uh, lawmakers, politicians were really tough on crime. And now we have an uh, overcrowded prison system. Um, so is it, is it a matter of being not so tough on crime? Well, I mean, I, I, one of the first bills I introduced 10 years ago when I was, uh, was to build another prison. I and mean, we, have, we have prison space for a population of the 1970s. And the population has, assuming that the crime rate stays more or less the same, you would expect the prisons to get bigger. But having said that, I do think that we shouldn't be looking, the, for the, the first time somebody commits a crime, especially for juveniles, we should not be looking to throw away the key. We should be looking to figure out why they did it and intervene at that level before we turn the prison system into a social welfare organization. Your can thoughts? I just, yes, can I just share that we spend $7 million a month incarcerating misdemeanants and petty misdemeanants. We are, so when we talk about fully funding education and everyone's like, well, where's the money? 
where do we want to put our money as a society? Do we want to invest it in prisons or invest it in schools? I think, you know, again, echoing what, what the other panelists have mentioned, we are over incarcerating and not offering therapeutic treatment or restorative justice. We need to, we need to reallocate that money to the schools. That's a greater return on our investment. Mm -hmm. Can I just add one thing? Another, another statistic that um, I recently read was 74% of people in our prisons are Class C felons. You know, so they're not necessarily the violent offenders that you know we need to have in prison, and a, a good portion of those are sent away to Saguaro. And then we have incidents in prison where you know, there's a lot of brutal brutalization, I guess. And so we really need, if we do cut down on the kind of uh, crimes that we're really attacking, and then we can drive down that seven million dollar figure, like you were saying, we can have we can free up money for more um, better programs for our community. You know, it's really interesting when you when you look at Chinatown. I mean, there was this incredible growth, uh, and then First Fridays happened, and and it, it seems like there's a new rejuvenation of businesses, a lot of boutiques coming up in the area. But then there's still this issue of homelessness. And, and Representative Rhodes, do you think that um, has actually kind of pushed back or pushed people away from moving in? or thinking twice before opening a business there, especially when you hear on the news that a bakery was just robbed last night? Well, it's certainly still an issue, but I, I think that the, the uh, business community in Chinatown is a vital one, and it's, it's, it's getting better. There's fewer and fewer empty storefronts. You know, six or seven years ago, there were a lot of empty storefronts. It's becoming a, a hip place, and uh, I, I mean, I live pretty close, so that the hipness level is not gonna keep going up with me living that close. <laughs> but, uh, you know, oh, come on. Uh, what, what, what is happening, unfortunately, is it's the, the, the people that were problem. There, there's still people who are problematic and who do horrible things in front of everybody's store in the morning, but a lot of them are moving uh, farther west. Uh, Evil A has become a real problem where there's just this element that's out of control, and now the businesses over there are complaining about the same kinds of things that the Chinatown businesses were mm -hmm. complaining about before. How do you think you, you could attract more tourists into the area? Commissioner, do you have any thoughts on that? You, especially in the Chinatown area where you have businesses that are starting to thrive and they're really cool places to go, and, and if there was a, a small influx of tourism, that could be generation of money in that area. Hmm. I don't, I'm not sure if, if tourism is, is the answer to addressing um, the issues of homelessness and, and or crime in that area. Um, you know, where I do, where I could see uh, the benefit of tourism is if we increase the transient accommodation tax. If we tax the tourist, the tourist, the tourism industry at a higher rate so that we can afford the services, of, so afford the services of the social programs we want. I mean, there's a, we're at maximum occupancy right now, and we're breaking records regarding individual spending by day, by tourists. Each tourist is spending more and more money every day. And at 100% occupancy, there's a huge, that's a huge revenue option that we must tap into. If we don't want to raise property taxes or raise income taxes, we have to shift the tax burden to visitors who want a piece of Hawaii. They're still going to come. I think that's what we've seen. Hotel rates have gone up. Flights have gone up, all these other costs go up. We need to increase the, the transit accommodation tax and then shift that revenue into services. You know, no politician really wants to talk about raising taxes, but Mr. Nakoa, would, would you support any of that? Um, I, I think I would have to study it a little bit closer. <clears throat> um, if memory serves transit, trans, transit accommodation tax, sorry. Um, is, uh, is, is done by percentage, so that, you know, as spending does go up, it, it, raises, it rises as well. Um, one thing that you know, I, I, w I would hope to, I, one way I would hope to try to bring more people into um, Chinatown is, is kind of just continue on the, the way of getting more um, trendy businesses, p places that people actually want to go. An interesting uh, conversation that I had with some friends earlier today was, um, that the Pokemon Go game has brought hundreds of people down to Kaka'ako <laughs> overnight. And uh, you know, I, I think <laughs> we need to be thinking outside of the box if we want to actually make a difference because you know, we've been trying to do this for generation or for decades, as long as I've been alive. <laughs> and um, you know, what's not, so some, what's something that might help out is some ingre uh, integration of social media and some other things that you know, are accessible now these days. Mm -hmm. 
uh, Representative Rhodes, a uh, Pokemon Go contest <laughs> in your neighborhood, perhaps? Well, uh, well, I think it's clear that Chinatown, maybe in the last six or seven years, has become a tourist destination. You see people unloading at buses uh, at several sites there at the Shinto Shrine on the on the College Walk every day, uh, the hundreds of people. Uh, there, it, it's in all the guidebooks. If you read, you know, if you if you read the uh, Lonely Planet about Hawaii, mm -hmm. there's a bunch of sites there. So I think for the last six or seven years, it's been uh, a very popular destination, and rightfully so. I mean, Chinatown is. You know, we always talk about Hawaiian sense of place. You go to Chinatown, and it's it's real. It's got some warts, but it's a real place, and people are interested in the authentic. You know, uh, one person said many of the crimes being committed are are they by homeless so obviously do you know the statistics in terms of you know your well, work in the judiciary is it is it let's say drug addicted or are they homeless or, or who are the people committing these crimes well my understanding this is a subsection of it my understanding is that the mentally ill are no no more likely to commit a crime than anybody else so there's there's a lot of concern that the mentally ill are committing crimes that they they do but it's not it's not at a higher rate than anybody else I think on the d drug addiction side, I think the statistics do bear out that a lot of times people are committing crimes to support their habits. You know, we spoke with one woman who's challenging the next senator from District 13 to present a plan on how he or she would work with the city. Let's hear from that person. So one of the things I think is really important to me is how, these, how the new senator will collaborate with the city so that things get done because we can't do this alone. I mean the city can't do it by themselves because they have um, different mandates and different resources uh, from the state and I want to see that money be being and capital and resources being used effectively. They got to collaborate. Uh, so that's kind of what I challenge them to do is how what what is important? How do they collaborate? What do they see their role in government and in, in establishing this, um, this partnership that has to happen between the city and the state? Uh, Mr. Nako, I mean, we, we hear that often, you know, city and state should work together, uh, you know, and the legislature may be asked again to extend Oahu's half percent excise tax surcharge to pay for this big project called the rail, uh, would you support that if you're in the legislature? Well, you know, I think, first of all, I think the rail is more than just a city issue at this point. It's become a Hawaii issue. And my, the way I think about issues in general is that if it's a concern to my constituents, it's a concern to me. You know, Senator Akaka and Danny Noy, who, whom I worked with up in Congress, they both had an emphasis on casework, is what they called the, the term. But what it really is, is it's, being respondent to, to your constituency and anything that they request, making sure that you can at least address whatever you can in, in your jurisdiction. Now, I think there needs to be more coordination with the city and the state as well as the federal government. And I would work very hard uh, to make sure that we're not being duplicative and we're not um, doing, you know, the right hand does one thing while the left hand does the other. I think we need to coordinate and we need to join forces much, much more. And I would work hard with, um, with the city officials, whoever becomes mayor next, um, as well as uh, you know our city council folks, and as and our federal level, I think we need to work with because um, they, they have a lot of the federal funding that would help out so many so much of our situations. But if you were asked to vote to extend Oahu's half percent oh, excise tax surcharge, would you vote for? Would you vote yes or no? Um, at this time, I'm very hesitant because I don't. I don't think the GET is, well, the GET is a regressive tax, first and foremost. Um, I think it does hit a lot of folks, um, you know, the working class people more uh, than it does the wealthy people just because it's a percentage of income issue. Um, so I don't think, and I, I've talk, talked to many people in our, in our community and, you know, they don't, they're not for extending the, the GET. Um, so I would have to vote with my, con, my constituency, but also, sorry, one, one other thing that kind of goes along with this is the 10% uh, ad, ad, what's it called? administration fee that the state is taking, the legislature is taking on top of the 0.5%. It's something that I don't think not everyone knows about, but it goes towards accountability and transparency in our government. If our state is going to be collecting an extra 5.5% from Oahu residents, it sh and you know, for the reason of building rail, it should go towards rail. And so 
we need to drop that number from 10% to something more reasonable because the, even the State Department of Taxation has said that that full 10% is not needed to fund the administ administration fees that they incur to, to administer that tax. Uh, Representative, would you support an extension of the tax? Well, I, I am a rail supporter. I'm unabashedly a rail supporter, but I'm, as a rail supporter, I'm like the most frustrated person in town because we're to this point where nothing makes any sense. So it, it doesn't, to me, it makes no sense to, to waste $2 billion and tear it back down. It doesn't make any sense to stop it at Middle Street because nobody will ride it. Uh, I think we need to finish it, but you know the legislature, including myself in years past, have been very cooperative with the city in providing the funding source, and there has been no city money whatsoever. There's never been a real property tax increase to cover rail, and all the rest of the money has been from the federal government. So I don't really know what's going to happen. I would certainly consider it, depending on, I think it would probably, at this point, just because of my read of where my colleagues are on it, I think it would have to be part of some kind of a bigger package where other sources of money were coming in too. But the, pro the reason the, the, the island of, uh, residents of the island of Oahu supported steel on steel rail in 2008 was because of the difficulty of commuting from the west side. And if we don't build, build rail, and you know, we, we, we end it prematurely somehow, that problem is still there and we've spent all this money. So. I think it really needs to be completed, but I'm not really sure how it's all going to fit together. So you would support some sort of funding mechanism to to get this train built all the way to Ala Moana? Yes, and, and I, you know, there's different places it could come from. I mean, other, other countries sell the air rights over stations, for example. That could be a substantial amount. The, the, there's been no, this, this is a capital improvement project where no money has been borrowed. That's totally unheard of. All capital improvement projects is borrowed money. I mean, 99.9% .9 of the time. So you have the biggest one in the history of the state, and there's been no borrowed money. There's, you could conceivably have non-recourse uh, non revenue bonds using the, using, borrowing against the stream of the income that you would get from running the rail. So I just don't think everything's been looked at yet. So I'm, I'm with Nick and uh, Mr. Nicole. I'm a little skeptical about it at this point, but I don't think it's a good idea to let rail die. Uh, uh, Commissioner, if you were to vote today right. on uh, an extension of that surcharge, yeah. what would you vote? I want to go back to a point uh, Representative Rhodes raised, which was the city and county has not put any, has not raised any money for rail. And we need to look at that because they haven't ra raised property taxes even on non-resident property owners. So there are many, many wealthy people who own second homes or even third homes in Hawaii whether it's a condo or actual um, piece of land with a, a home on it. Um, we need to be able to tax them at a higher rate. They are taking up space. And a lot of them say that Hawaii is the reason why they keep a second property here is because it's one of the lowest property taxes in the nation. I mean, they're laughing all the way to the bank. I mean, if they buy a luxury property and they sell it in five years, they will make enough money that they got to vacation here for free. That's ridiculous. We need to really capture that revenue. It'll disincentivize people. Purchase. There are a lot of condos throughout downtown and even Waikiki that are not occupied. They're just, maybe they're occupied a couple months of the year. They should be rented out. I mean, when we talk about the housing shortage, there's one of the answers right there. So I would, I would vote to extend the tax if as leverage and as an incentive for the city and county to, to raise property taxes for non-resident property owners and corporations who own property in Hawaii. Um, and I would also put another contingent in there that we cut GET on food, medication, and medical supplies. That's what the regressive tax that Mr. Nakar mentioned. Um, that would be one way to start fixing a regressive tax. Cut GET on food, medications, and medical supplies. Uh, Representative, uh, you're hearing from Commissioner raising taxes in one area but reducing taxes in another. Is, is that the solution? Well, that's always the tricky part, right? So you gotta, if you're going to cut taxes somewhere, you've got to make it up or you have to cut actual services. So, I mean, that's 90% uh, of what we do at the legislature is trying to balance uh, you know, who, who pays what, when, and, and what you're going to keep and what, what services you're going to keep and what services you're going to get rid of. I would, I would add, though, that, you know, what... The, the real property tax is true that the real property taxes in Hawaii are the lowest uh, just about anywhere in the country. And the main reason for that is because the state pays for the educational system. Most, most places, the local governments do. But 
it doesn't feel like we're paying low real property taxes because our land values are so high. So it, you know, there's a lot of catch 22s in this whole uh, this whole debate. Uh, you were talking about land, and uh, Terry from Kihei Maui says, uh, rents have skyrocketed since vacation rentals in residential areas mm -hmm. started. He would like to see rent control. Anything being done about that? Uh, Mr. Nakoa, your thoughts? Um, I, honestly, I'm not completely sure what, it, what has been done so far in rent control, but we need to make sure that there is more. I mean, I know that <clears throat> we don't have, we currently don't have rent control um, in, 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 our, in our housing market, so you know, more has to be done. At the same time, I think one of the, the issues that we need to do is make sure that there aren't all these, all more of these uh, million and a half dollar developments uh, that are happening in our community. So there's one community at the back of Paoa um, that, that was developed for million and a half dollar homes where there aren't infrastructure built, there isn't, um, the road isn't wide enough. And there's another, there's another project that's coming up in the back of Nu'uwanu, on the back of Kamaina. If you look at the mountain, there's this big cutout of trees. And you know, luckily, a lot of the community stepped forward and didn't allow that to happen. But at the same time, we need to make sure that if development is happening, we, that a portion, at least, has to, be part, has to be affordable housing. And it's not phase three that it has to come in. It has to come in each step of the way. Because conveniently, sometimes, when phase three is the affordable housing, money runs out at phase two. Uh, Representative, what would you say to Terry from Kihei Maui, who's clearly upset about these vacation rentals and, and uh, the perception of being squeezed out of the area? Well, I, I completely agree. I think that that's one of one of the biggest drivers of uh, high uh, high prices for uh, for housing for us is that we're competing not with just with each other; we're competing with the whole world. Uh, rent control, I've always been skeptical about, and the reason is that I worked on Capitol Hill almost 30 years ago, and I worked for a New Yorker and they do have rent control in New York City and there are a lot of weird side effects from it. One is that the, because they can't raise the rent, they, they also generally don't fix up the apartments. There's all these scams where people try to pass it on from one person to another and they'll be the, like the third generation living in the same rent control. And they, but it, if, they, if they can hide it from the landowner that this is happening, they can keep the rent down. And I don't know, maybe there's a way to make it work, but I think what we're really looking at are market forces that we need to to corral some other way, probably some other way. But I, you know, I'm open to the idea. I mean, at this point, I'm open to talking about anything because it's such a huge problem. Commissioner, right. you thank you. Little? So, rent control on its own doesn't won't, will not solve the problem. Rent control is often used to disincentivize flipping property, right? So if you have tenants in there who have a certain uh, cap on their rent, you can't try to sell it to a new buyer who's then going to jack up the rents. So it'll slow the flipping of property. And that flipping of property is what makes um, apartment rentals so expensive. So I can tell you as a, as a landowner, I purchased a building um, in 2004, and within a year of fixing it up, um, I was offered 100% return on my investment. And I thought to myself at that moment, either I'm gonna be part of the problem or part of the solution, and that's when I decided to make sure that the units were affordable. And I realized that the families that I inherited from the original owners uh, when I bought the building, they could never afford double the rent, right? So if somebody pays me double the amount, their mortgage is gonna be doubled, right? So this is what we, this rent control would go towards disincentivizing flipping property. And that, that's the key, and I think that we can do that through charging larger, a higher rate of conveyance tax. For instance, if people are just flipping property just to make a quick buck, not thinking about the families who are gonna be impacted by that, we need to create, a, we can disincentivize it by increasing the conveyance tax. I wanted to get to just a more general question, actually, and this one comes from Francisco Colantes. And Francisco wants to know, what sets the candidates apart from each other? Representative, what sets you apart from the other two sitting oh, across from you? Experience, just plain and simple. I've been in the legislature for 10 years already. If, if, my, if the constituents from Senate District 13 elect me, I'll hit the ground running. I've been chair of the Judiciary Committee for the last four years. It's one of the most... The Star Advertiser called it the, one of the most perilous political positions in the state, and I navigated that just fine. And uh, you know, I, I know what I'm doing. I'll, I can do a good job, and I know I can. Mr. Nakoa. Yeah. Um, 
So I don't have the 10 years of experience in the state legislature, but what I do have is 30 years of experience in this community. My family, again, my family has been here for five generations. We've built a lot of this uh, the infrastructure in this community. My grand great grandfather was Moses Akiona, and he built many of the roads going through Nuwanu. Uh, my great, my Popo and Gung, they, we call them my great grandparents. Um, they you know, helped to revitalize Chinatown back in the 50s. They were part of Choi Hung Village Society. So, you know, I don't have that experience in the state legislature, but I do have broad experience. I've worked in every branch of government. Um, I've worked at every level of government, city, state, local, uh, city, state, and federal. I've worked in the judiciary. I've worked in the uh, legislative in Congress, and I've worked in the executive branch for consumer protection. You know, and I think that what I, most importantly, what I would do and it's something that Senator Akaka did and something that Suzanne Chen Oakland did was listen to the community and really understand what it is that they want. And um, Senator Akaka inspired me to run for public office ex exactly for that reason. It's because he had such a big heart. And I was wondering how I could be of service to my community and what I could do. Because uh, I'm a nice guy. <laughs> and unfortunately, I, I, felt, I felt, oh, well, I don't know if I can do this or that. but. With Senator Kaka and the amount of aloha that he has all the time for everyone, you know, that's really what drove me um, into public service. Commissioner Iwamoto, I'll, I'll give you the you. last word on this. So what you. sets you apart? From right, I think there are two factors that set me apart. The first is my experience with public education. I've put in over 10,000 hours working on public education in Hawaii. Serving on the Board of Education was a full-time job. And um, I took a lot of that work home with me as well. Secondly, in terms of the, addressing homelessness, I think I don't think any other candidate has been working directly on the front lines of homelessness since 2001 as I have. As I mentioned, I, I started off as a homeless outreach coordinator and I became the volunteer um, legal services um, managing attorney and we did legal clinics in homeless shelters. Secondly, I became a foster parent to teenagers who had been previously homeless. So literally homelessness is an issue that hits me at home. Um, Finally, um, as an apartment um, building owner, I again have allocated units to house low income um, families as well as previously homeless families. So I've been on the front lines dealing with this issue and it means a lot to me and I, I would bring all of that experience with me to the legislature. Well, Commissioner, Representative, and Mr. Nakoa, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Uh, we have a lot to think about after tonight's discussion and hopefully our viewers are more enlightened after tonight. Again, mahalo for joining us tonight and best of luck to our primary candidates, our Democratic candidates from Senate, State Senate District 13. Next week, we'll focus on candidates running in two hotly contested neighbor island races. And on October, uh, August 18th, rather, the leading candidates for Big Island Mayor in the general election will sit down for the entire show to discuss the issues from Hawaii County. And then join us on August 25th when we talk to two gentlemen who want to be the next state senator from Hawaii Kai and Aina Haina. And of course, don't forget to vote in the upcoming primary election in August 18th. We leave you tonight with a discussion, August 13th rather, we leave you tonight with a discussion between the three Honolulu mayoral candidates who appeared on a special insights from Monday night. Moderator Daryl Huff actually signed off on the broadcast portion of that show and continued with the three candidates via a live stream. He asked them to bring up a topic that's not being given the attention it deserves, something that they feel is important. Now this turned to a heated discussion and a very interesting exchange. We close this show with that conversation and we'll see you next Next week, right here on Insights on PBS Hawaii. I'm Mahia Lenny Richardson. Ahoi ho. Thank you for staying with us for this live Insights stream as we continue our conversation with the leading candidates for Honolulu Mayor. As candidates, you guys make a lot of appearances out there. You talk to the public a lot. We got a lot of questions today. Uh, some were it very interesting and random. What, what thing do you hear from people that we're not uh, talking about enough? And let me have Mr. Dijoux start with that. What's going on with ethics at the city government here and how the City Ethics Commission has been completely railroaded. That uh, when the Caldwell administration came in, they, when the, Chuck Tato, the executive director of the Ethics Commission, uh, started asking the wrong questions about the mayor's political fundraising, then felt political pressure and has since resigned. And I find that very disturbing. You know, I worked with Chuck Tato when I was a member of the Honolulu City Council. I didn't always agree with him. 
but uh, I thought he was a good, hardworking, dedicated public servant. And he was the ex ethics director under Jeremy Harris, under Mufi Hanneman, under Peter Carlyle, no problems. But when Kirk became mayor, all of a sudden he had all of this turbulence. I think that's wrong, and it's something that we need to correct, because integrity of our government is enormously important. What would you do, though, about forward-looking, changing the system, I mean... Uh... Well, first and foremost, I would call for the reinstatement of Chuck Tato. I think he was a very good ethics director. I think he should be reinstated. And I think the direction that this, the Ethics Commission is going today to becoming almost a quasi-judicial body rather than an advisory body, uh, I think is wrong. Uh, ethics is very, very important. You know, when I first got elected to the city council, we had problems that several members of the city council went to prison uh, for, for ethical lapses. And that's why I pushed allowing the Ethics Commission to issue fines on those who, visit, who, who violate the ethics code. And, and interestingly enough, two of the members who fought me on that were eventually fined uh, uh, themselves on this. Uh, go ahead. You, you started talking yeah, about ethics. Absolutely not equivocally. Yeah. There has been a complete evisceration of ethics in the city and county of Honolulu. It's been booted out the door. There is no ethics commission right now that's having any effect on anything. Uh, these people came in out of the blue. They started making mistake after mistake after mistake. You had this absolute magnificent history by Chuck Tato doing everything absolutely well. He got involved with luau problems. He told me he couldn't have many more, and suddenly all and all and all gone. The ethics is finished. So is that what we really want? to have happen in our future? Absolutely not. You need to get somebody like Tato, somebody with integrity, to be able to move forward and put somebody in there who can do the kind of stuff that they were doing before. And that's critical. I, the fact that we could actually be without ethics in the city and county of Honolulu is an absolute disgrace. Okay, Mr. Caldwell, I saved this up for you. Go ahead. Let's look at the facts. I appointed three members of the Ethics Commission. The majority of the members were appointed by Peter. So any decision that's been made, that's going to be made, has been made by a combination, three by me and the majority by his, his appointees. There is a commission that is strong and independent. Yes, I've appointed three members and I've sent down the name of a fourth one. Retired judges who retired at very honorably, strong and independent, and to somehow imply that they're being told what to do is an insult, an insult to them, I believe. I believe that the Ethics Commission is independent. The Ethics Executive Director reports to the Commission, just like every other director of a Commission reports to the Commission. And Charles likes to blend the two and create issues that are not correct. And he needs to level with the public when he says these things, because we have a strong, independent Ethics Commission. Now, Chuck, from what I understand from the stories in your, in, covered by Hawaii News Now, he tendered his resignation and every single member of the commission accepted his resignation, including Peter's members, who are the majority. Now, I don't know why he did that, but just today, Laura Wong, who was his deputy, returned back to work. She's the interim executive director. And I think that's fantastic that she's come back, and I think we're going to continue to see decisions being made that need to be made. You know, Peter's argument that somehow this, this luau thing, there was an investigation and no wrongdoing was found by the executive director or the commission. Plain and simple, that is the fact. Pure, unequivocal rot, and he should be ashamed of what he's done, and he's not. Well, let me ask you, Charles, is you, I mean, is it really, though, fair to say that Bear Caldwell gagged the ethics director yes. when, well, when in fact <laughs> what happened from his administration was the corp council was asking some questions the corp councils uh, suggested that these 90-day contracts that were basically paying for the administrate the investigator should end well, there, but, but I mean in terms of directly let's go back here Chuck Tato, who's been the uh, executive director of the City Ethics Commission for not years, but for almost two decades here, uh, he interacted, he had, he crossed swords with, he butted heads with, with numerous very, very strong-willed individuals. I mean, from, from, from Mayor Harris to Mayor Hanneman to Mayor Car Carlisle here. And he butted heads with city council members like myself. But I always thought he was fair and he was hardworking. But only when Kirk Caldwell became mayor, all of a sudden he hit turbulence because he asked the wrong questions about the mayor's fundraising. So, and all of a sudden, he had to report to the Corporation Council. They required him to do things like report what he was doing every six 
minutes. That was actually that was to crazy. the commission itself, though. Yeah. And the right. question yeah. is, the question is, I have to do say, you believe it wasn't? It didn't it report to the corporation council. It reports to the commission. Get your facts straight on that, it Charles. Is absolutely that is a misstatement. No, it's a Kirk, misstatement. Kirk knows he's vulnerable on this here. He knows that the Ethics Commission had enormous amount of respect and integrity. It was an independent agency until Kirk became mayor. All these problems have occurred under his administration. But our, that's why on day one, I think we got to replace, uh, ask Chuck to come back. Just, to the just, just, just to make sure that we're 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 on point here. What uh, Mr. Caldwell said is that the commission made these decisions. Do you have any evidence that the commission itself was directly influenced by some factor other than their own interest and in what they wanted to do? Other than that this is a remarkable amount of coincidence that a longtime, hardworking civil servant operated the exact same way under multiple mayors for over a decade and a half, and all of a sudden a new mayor comes in and things completely are turned inside out and upside down. Because this is two against one, uh, Mayor Cobb, I'll give you the last word on it. Yeah, I don't know what else I can say other than that it's an independent commission. I appointed commissioners. They're very good commissioners. The three retired judges and now the Peter Adler that I sent. No, no dispute, these guys probably have all worked with Peter Adler at one point or another. That's my job. The Ethics Commission needs to do their job, and I believe they're doing it. And to imply anything else is a disrespect to the members of that commission, including the majority that Peter appointed. I think they are independent and are doing their job. People, I mean, I don't, Charles doesn't like the result, um, but I think it's not the job of the mayor to influence what the commission does. It seems like he'd like to do that. Okay, thank you very much. Gentlemen, it was very interesting. Peter, Peter Carlisle. <laughs> thank you, Carol. Thanks. Thank Charles, you. is you. Thanks, you. Thanks Sam.